So today I've got Stacey Rosman Marinkovic, I always call her Rosman still, on the line with me and we're going to talk a little bit about West Coast Fever and your coaching and your past experience as an athlete, albeit as you say a long time ago, I say it's still relevant. And I guess get some ideas from you today, Stace, on a little bit about sports psychology and how you see it as a coach. Um, what stands out for you when you're looking at a group of athletes, you know, in terms of if you are going through a selection process. And I guess the last thing we want to cover off is tips for athletes who are sitting at home at the moment, you know, kids who have got no um, school sports and no weekend sports at the moment. How can they keep practicing? How can they stay engaged during this time? So, I'm going to quickly hand over to you to give us a bit of a rundown of, of you and your background for those that don't know. Yeah, so for me, um, I'm originally from Queensland. I uh, have been uh, moved over to Perth when I was 21, so I've been over here quite a while now. Um, and I guess my background is that I've always been involved in sport. Netball was a huge passion of mine from just starting playing with friends when I was eight years old. and went all the way through all my junior playing career, um, I guess, in Queensland, um, representing, um, you know, the 17s, 19s, 21s um, state teams. And then from there, I went to the AIS as a player. Um, so first time moving out of home, um, being in a controlled environment, but also feeling like I was uh, queen of the world. And, uh, and then from there, went back to Queensland and I played for the Queensland Firebirds for a couple of seasons and then came over and and back then it wasn't the West Coast Fever, it was the Perth Orioles. Um, so I played with them, um, captain the side um, through that part of my playing career and, and then was the inaugural, co uh, inaugural, inaugural captain of the Fever. So I um, have been able to travel all around Australia, met many, many different people across my playing career. And then I guess as my career came to an end um, and I was captaining side and evolving my leadership, I really had a passion for the game and, and what I could pass on to others. So that ability to um, go into coaching was something that was um, really at the forefront. Um, so then I um, surrounded myself with some very experienced and knowledgeable people in high performance and, and took the skill sets of many different coaches that I've been um, exposed to and, and tried to evolve my way of coaching. Um, so then I coached the, uh, the 19s um, WA State team, uh, the Western Sting. Um, I got to be the assistant coach to Norma Plummer when she was the, the Fever head coach. And, and then after her reign, I was uh, able to, um, you know, be fortunate enough to be appointed as the head coach. Um, so I've gone through the Queensland netball pathway as a player and then I've also been through the pathway of netball WA as a player and a coach um, and yeah as I said evolved many different skill sets um, across that journey. So that's quite an unusual pathway for a coach because a lot of coaches actually don't play at the elite level so you've had that experience playing and coaching at the elite level and you mentioned um, being assistant coach for Norma Plummer and that's where you and I first started working together in sport we had known each other previously another story um, but that's where you, you and I started working together and I guess for me having watched you evolve over those years going from an assistant coach role to an outstanding head coach what has been the keys to your success I guess as a coach, but I guess some of that would carry over, some of those disciplines would carry over from your days as an athlete too. So talk us through a little bit about the keys to success, you think? Yeah, probably the most significant one for me from coaching um, was going through as a player. I think you can um, draw on other people for your confidence um, in some parts. And I didn't realise how much I... Um, relied on people's feedback to understand whether I was good, not good, um, and looked at that externally, I guess, towards the later part of my playing career and then transitioning into coaching. And, and the biggest decision to take on the head coach of Fever was that I had to have an inner self-confidence. And I guess that's where uh, you and I have worked on things over a, a, quite a journey is that, um, you know, the, the psychology around that and being able to draw on skill sets and, and things like that to be able to uh, 
um, under the greatest of pressure and, and um, you know, intensities and expectation and things like that, that I can draw within myself to be able to still make um, good decisions under, under pressure and, and when emotion is extremely high, um, that I can still make that tough call if needed um, and still keep that clarity. Um, and I think that's something that um, had I had as a player, I think sometimes you think um, you would do things a little bit different. I think hindsight's a, a wonderful thing, I guess. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I didn't know what those skill sets were as I, when I was a player. Um, and it's only when I really wanted to be the head coach that I decided that um, for me to be able to take on that kind of um, position, I, I needed to have a, a real understanding of me as a person. Um, and I think I've got a good insight, which has then enabled me to understand the athletes um, that I've coached and, and also embrace what sports psychology, performance psychology can bring to a team. And you make a really interesting point for me The performing under pressure is a big one because ideally that's what separates sport from a lot of things and particularly the elite level sport from um, pre-elite and weekend sport. There's pressure in all of it, but that elite level, the pressure is next level. So you've got lots of um, performance related and selection related pressure, but we also have pressures that are external to that now in terms of social media, media, people getting involved in making comments about you. What's your thoughts on, on all of that and the secrets to dealing with that, that big pressure now that exists in particularly elite sport and preparing for that? Yeah. And I think that's, it's obviously evolving and it continues to evolve the, the keyboard warriors are out there. Um, everyone has um, an opinion and, you know, everyone's entitled to that. But I guess the tone in which some of those messages can come directed at you um, can be quite confronting. And I think um, that's certainly something that I've experienced as a coach, um, particularly if you have the difference between a, a winning and a losing season um, is quite significant in how, um, feedback does come back towards you uh, through those social media forums um, and I think that's still my ability to cope with that has been because um, you know the, the self-confidence that I've got um, because I'm very structured and methodical in the way I put a program together um, and things like that I, I know that I have done my homework I've got all the data I've got all the information I've done my scouting all those type of things um, there's a lot of layers in which um, I've gone through to be able to make good decisions and whilst people would differ with that um, I don't think anyone really truly understands the background as to what we all go through when we make those decisions and and that's something that I've learned so um, people can have their opinion, but I also understand all the layers and information that I've been able to collate to make sure that, um, you know, I'm doing the right thing by our club at this point in time. And that ties into one of the, the key things that we see in sport and performance psychology, whether it's in sport or in business, and that's that concept of worry about the process and not the outcome. Talk to us a little bit about that, because as you say, you are a very process-driven coach. Um, and having gone through it, as, as I say, you know, I've known you for a, a long time now. And I've one of the things that I really respect about you is your trust and your faith in the process. And always coming back to the process, irrespective of results. Talk us a little bit through your, of your thinking on that. Yeah, I think one of the things, first and foremost, you always got to surround yourself with really good people um, because that enables you to put good processes in place. Um, you've got to trust the experts that you you surround yourself with. So, you know, people like yourself, um, I've got a performance analyst, team manager, assistant coaches, all these people have skill sets that I completely trust to be able to do um, to do their job. And I guess the, the part... Um, with all of that is um, with the process, if you have all the knowledge, then you actually go through step by step. And, and we keep really good records. I think that's the number one thing is when you're making decisions, you want to know what you put in place so that if you want to um, assess whether it worked or not, you need to understand, well, why did you do it? 
Um, so I think that's something that we do really well as a club is that we, we put those steps in place so that we can review and that if it works, we want to make sure that we keep doing that. Um, and I guess the, one of the things around process is that you always say focus on the process, but the process always leads to an outcome. So you've got to find that balance that while you're always process driven, you're not... Um, you're not so narrow-minded that it ends up looking towards the future all the time as well. So staying in the moment um, is something whilst you want to have visions, and I think that's my job as a head coach, is you, you do have a vision for the club, but staying in the moment is really important so that, um, you know, the players stay here um, with you. Yeah. And I think that the, the process orientation or thinking about process really links into goal setting, particularly, you know, on how to achieve, I guess, the success or the outcome piece. Because as you say, you don't want to lose sight of that. That's, that's really important. That's where you get your growth from. And you also want to enjoy some of that success and some of those outcomes, don't you? And we've talked a little bit about that at Fever over the last couple of years is enjoying the success. So tell us some of your thinking on that too, because I really like the way you do that within our group. Yeah, that's something that I learned going through coaching about enjoying those moments for success. I'm, I'm very driven and, and some would say um, a perfectionist in, in some parts. So we always set goals or, or benchmarks or key performance indicators, all those type of things. And as soon as we achieved one, I was ready for the next thing. So, you know, we, we ticked a box or, or we got that goal and we moved straight to the next one and the next one and the next one. And I think um, it came to me someone, uh, I can't remember who it was, but we'd, had, we'd achieved something and, and someone said, oh, that's really, really well done. And my response to that was, oh, yeah, but we need to now focus on this. And someone, they said, well, hang on, did you just hear what I said? And I'm like, uh, yeah. And they go, take a moment to enjoy it um, because that's something that as a leader, if I don't enjoy those moments, the players around me don't enjoy those moments either and they were always looking for the next thing. So um, you, can, or you can get caught just keeping going with that process um, but it is important to acknowledge, to celebrate the wins and I think that's what we did really well in 2018, um, the year that we made the grand final is that we achieved many first things for the club um, and we actually... I remember uh, the week before the grand final, we actually made a, a like a ladder that went up the wall at the back of the State Netball Centre um, and it showed every single achievement that we had done that year. And, you know, it still brings goosebumps because it was a moment where everyone from manager, performance analyst, psychologist, players president, CEO could go, look what we've achieved. Um, and that was before we even took the court in a grand final. So I think, um, you know, there are wins and losses in, in games, but there's many things that we've achieved along the way as well. Yeah, it was certainly the moment that you're talking about will always stick in my mind forever. I'll, I'll never forget that feeling um, of standing there with you guys and the group and looking at that and being incredibly proud of, all of us and the team and yourself and the coaches and the club for what we had done and what we had achieved that year. It was an incredible moment. So I want to flip that a little bit right now and talk about, I guess we're all stuck inside um, and <laughs> the moments that we can go in outside is sort of our front and backyard. So there's a lot of kids and a lot of teens and a lot of emerging athletes right now who we know are sitting at home going, well, that's it. Why, why bother? I'm not motivated. Let's talk about some of your ideas on how they can stay connected and what they can do right now because it's kind of like a pre-pre-season or it's, it's a strange kind of pre-season. But what can they do to stay engaged and connected and stay focused on their sport? Because I guess this time is equally as important as, as any other time in preparing for playing. Yeah, I think it's, it's like if you were injured, um, mm. something's taken away from you and you can't do that particular thing at that point in time. But you always find something else that you can focus on. So, you know, if you hurt your ankle, you can get fitter in your upper body. If you, you know, hurt your shoulder, then you do a lot of running. So, you know, there's, there's things that you do when you're injured. And I think this 
part of isolation is is no different. Um, that there'll be things that you are limited in because of space and resources and things like that. But there's some things that you can get really, really good at. Um, and, you know, from a, a physical point of view or a skill point of view, um, you know, there's many things you can do in the backyard to keep that, that strength happening. There's, um, you know, things that you can do with the ball against a wall, um, throwing tennis balls, like all sorts of things. Learn to juggle for the first time. Um, there's lots of apps that you can look at or websites that can give you just little coordination challenges. So I think that's always set one little task in a day um, and maybe something that you've never done before or thought you couldn't do and set that for the week and see how, how far you've progressed. Um, I think the other thing is, Everyone is so busy in life, um, you know, with work, school, um, trainings, you know, all sorts of things that you, you do. So what can you do when you've actually now got some free time? Um, and I think mindfulness is a big part of that. And, you know, I'm one that um, doesn't do it extremely well um, and still looking at avenues as to what suits me best. But little things, Jodes, I know you came to the club and it was, you know, you gave us a, a picture that we had to colour in and it was that, that time to sit there for 15 minutes and absorb yourself in um, making this picture come to life. Um, so there's little things that you can do across that um, that I think if life was going the way it is, you wouldn't take that time. And it's an easy way to make an excuse that you can't do it. So I think if you can obtain those skills now, when life does become busy, you'll be so good at putting the mindfulness in. You might only need 10 minutes of it, but it'll be 10 minutes that completely refreshes you, keeps your mind clear and, and therefore you you do your schoolwork better, um, you engage with people better and, and you become a better athlete as well. Yeah, and I think you make the really good points there is there's physical skills that we can be working on. There's there's technical and ball handling skills and footwork things that we can be working on. And and I I imagine that some of the girls are putting some stuff up and West Coast Fever are putting some stuff up on their socials at the moment for, for people to have a look at drills and things like that and some of the fun things the girls are doing. But also this is an incredibly good time to challenge that um, dealing with frustration because this is, this is like a global <laughs> frustration right now. So how are we handling that and what are we observing about ourselves and dealing with that? Because that's going to come up in sports. So like you say, there's, there's even space for working on our mental skills and our mindfulness and our concentration and, and things like that. And I'm super excited to see your socials in the next few weeks of you learning to juggle. I think you just told us that you were going to do that. <laughs> so I'm going to hold you to that. So juggling, oh, what a, what juggling 101. I went to dinner. Yeah, I went to do some skills to demonstrate for people um, that were out there and I, I sent out a frantic message to our players going, look, I will describe what you're doing, but can you please send through all your drills that you're doing at home because um, I look like a bit of a nuffy doing it these days where they're highly trained and, and coordinated. So, um, yeah, I, I certainly will describe the activities on the, the Fever social pages, but I... I won't be demonstrating it. This I think it's time important around. that you share that with the mums out there. You know, like uh, how to how to come back post baby. I think that's really really important. So tell me, this is a this is a question I get asked a lot about. And you know, is is talent important, or what is it about in terms of selections? And you've talked about having worked with younger athletes and things like that. But I guess it applies at the elite level as well. What is it that you look for when you're selecting? Is it purely talent or is there more to that picture? Yeah, I certainly think there's more. I think you get recognised a little bit easier um, when you do have a talent, um, but I think that can only take you so far. And particularly in our game, um, it is a team sport. So there's so many more different dynamics to it than just being a skillful player um, because you can be a skillful player, but if you can't, combine um, and work with people around you, it makes it extremely hard to to be able to transfer that onto a court and into a performance. So, you know, ability, um, teamwork, which is all about you building your relationships, um, that communication, giving and receiving feedback. Um, you, you've got to be um, coachable. You're always looking for athletes that um, can take on board some information and ha give it a go. Um, I think the other thing is just um, 
intensity and work ethic. Um, you know, when you're trying to build a, a really strong club culture like we are at the Fever, you can't have any passengers with you. Um, and I think that's the part is, you know, you, you've got to lead by example. Um, and you can, the harder you train, the better the person beside you is going to get. And as I said, it's all about teamwork. Um, so I think there's... But can you see teamwork? Can you see resilience when you're looking at athletes? And what does it look like? Teamwork, yeah, absolutely, because I think it's it's the things that you do that um, doesn't necessarily get the reward straight away. So, you know, that drive to the pocket where you don't get the ball, but you've drawn the defenders to allow someone else to get the ball. It's the hard work of a goal defence and wing defence out the front so the goalkeeper can get the best intercept at the, at the back. Um, you know, there's all those little things that I think demonstrate what teamwork um, really looks like um, and I guess the resilience part is you know things don't come to people easy all the time I, I think there's there's parts where people do get into a lot of teams and the selection goes quite smoothly maybe for a few years um, but every athlete at some point would have a challenge and whether that's from not being selected or whether it's from um, experiencing an injury um, or, you know, having to sit on the bench for a period of time until you gain skills that then get you into a starting position. There's, there's always those challenges and you can either step towards it and um, keep working harder and keep embracing the coach's feedback and, and also developing yourself not only as a player but a person. Um, you know, they, they're the things that shows how tough you are as a player and, and what you're prepared to do to make the team the best it can be. So I'm hearing persistence, effort, energy, attitude, all of that stuff is really important. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Some great tips there. So I'm going to ask you just to close off today. What would be your advice to people watching this, sitting there at home feeling demotivated what what's getting you through right now um through this difficult time and being stuck inside predominantly yeah i guess for me um i think everybody's in the same boat so i, I don't think i have any more right than anyone else to be frustrated and i know there's other people a lot worse off than where I am at the moment. So you've got to embrace that positivity. Um, I've got my health. Um, I can go outside. I can get in the fresh air and, and do some exercise. Um, I have time. Um, at the moment, I'm actually embracing being a mum. Um, so you don't often get that time to just spend one-on-one -on -one with with my, my little boy. So, you know, there's, there's things like that that you get to do that's different. Um, and I think, you know, for me, being a mum will help me be a better coach um, in a different way. And I think that's what all the kids and, and parents and things like that you can do, um, whether it's quality time passing the ball backwards and forwards with your mum and dad or, you know, your sister, brother, um, whether it's just getting more skillful, throwing the ball against a wall, setting yourself challenges. Um, by setting yourself challenge means you're having to put a goal in place and it might be a short-term one, but then you get to celebrate it. So reward yourself at the end of the week when you've actually conquered something because you've spent half an hour every day, every morning, just really focused on, on something new. Um, so, you know, I think, yeah, you can, you can always pick up new skills, um, plenty of books to read as well. Um, you know, for those, those that do like reading lots of, uh, lots of things on leadership and, and resilience and, you know, even if it's a, you know, just any, anything that makes you a better person, I think, um, is worthwhile. Really good advice. And we really appreciate your time today having a chat about this for everybody. And also um, thanks to Matthew for staying quietly asleep. <laughs> we were timing this all day around his nap. So good job. We got that done. Yeah, um, I hope and it goes um, a little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> good luck with that. And uh, I look forward to the juggling videos. I, I can't wait. I think yeah, you I'll try. Out, I think you're throwing me under the bus with that one. So I I'm going to put it back in. I let's see who's better in the next week. <laughs> okay, let, let's do that. I, I, I might have to find something to juggle with, but, you know, we you can... You know what? I'll drop some tennis balls on your doorstep. <laughs> I've got a box of 60 of them. <laughs> Super. Challenge accepted. All right. Stay well. Thank you, Stace. All right. Thanks. Bye.